Let's see, welcome, Geology of Washington lecture series. We took care of that. Mount Stewart, a closer look. Okay, so we all know Mount Stewart. It's a spectacular landmark just north of town. How much do you know about it? Maybe you know the biology of it, the landscape, the wildlife ecology. Maybe you know about something else, some angle with Mount Stewart. Do you know about the geology of Mount Stewart? If you were with us last spring when we did these six lectures, I did a Mount Stewart lecture to start with. But it was pretty basic, and we stopped at a safe place to stop. Tonight we're going past that, and we're going to get into a controversy or a scientific debate about Mount Stewart. And that's the part that's got me a little nervous, because I did my homework in the last week, and uh, it's juicy. So we'll see how that goes. So that's why this is Mount Stewart, a closer look. If you've been part of this series, we've already looked at Mount Stewart, but we're going to go a little bit deeper now and a little bit more advanced. OK, let's start basically. OK, so everybody, if you, especially if you're brand new to us and brand new to geology, at least we can get you something tonight, get your money's worth, even though there, there was no money. OK, great. So Mount Stewart looks like that. And Mount Rainier looks like that. Mount Rainier is a volcano. Mount Rainier has erupted many, many times in the past, and it will erupt many, many times in the future. There's magma beneath Mount Rainier right now. It's an active volcano. Mount Stewart is not. So that's item one. Mount Stewart is not a volcano. It has never been a volcano. It never will be a volcano. So how do we know that? Well, number one, the shape is wrong. To be an active volcano, an active cone-shaped volcano, we need a beautiful ice cream cone contoured uh, shape. OK, great. Uh, so the shape is wrong. But more specifically, rock-wise, we can also prove that Mount Stewart is not a volcano. Mount Rainier is made out of lava flows and ashy layers as well from past eruptions of that mountain. Mount Stewart, even at the very tippy top of the mountain, is a rock called granite. Now, for those that know granite and know how granite forms, that's the end of the story. Mount Stewart is not a volcano because there's granite even at the top of the mountain. But let's say you don't know what granite is or know how granite forms. Here's how it forms. That's a volcano. Underneath a volcano, we have a big room, a big cartoonish room that we call a magma chamber. It probably doesn't look nice simple like that, but we've got this plumbing system that's full of magma that feeds the volcanic eruptions. Now, if we take the heat away and we solidify all of the magma, both in the volcano and in the magma chamber down below, that's how we form granite. Granite forms down here. Granite forms in the dark by taking liquid rock, magma, and cooling it slowly underground. Never sees the light of day. So how do we see granite up here hiking around Angles Lake if granite only forms way down in the dark below a volcano? The answer is we shut off the system, we freeze the pipes, everything is solid rock, and then we slowly start to erode whether it's glaciers and rivers eroding at the surface or actual tectonic uplift pushing against the erosion. But the point is, we literally erode the whole volcanic system away and then suddenly we have that granite that was in the magma chamber now above ground even at 9,000 feet at the top of Mount Stewart. We have this coarse-grained, plutonic igneous rock that formed underground. Mount Stewart is not a volcano. OK there? That's the end of our first task. Now, if you were with us back in May, you know that. Maybe you've known that anyway. OK, let's dig a little deeper. Do we know the age of the granite? We do. The granite in Mount Stewart is 93 million years old formed 93 million years ago. And how do we come up with those numbers? That's a whole nother lecture. We could do that if you want. It's a very controversial topic, right? 
But today, we're talking about geology, and we're just going to have to take these numbers at face value. 93 million years old. OK, the plot thickens now. This is a mountain that many of us think of as in the Cascades. The Cascades, to most of us, are the beautiful mountains that we have between here and the west side of the mountains, right? And some of those are volcanoes. So if I draw a quick map of Washington, <laughs> and there's Ellensburg, and here's Seattle. Are you with me? And we've got five active cones, Baker, Glacier Peak, Rainier, Adams, and St. Helens, right? Those are the five active cones that we have, volcanoes that we have. And in this corridor, in this Cascade Corridor, we have lots of other old volcanoes that have crumbled away, just like we talked about, and there's granite in its place. But the point is, we have the Cascades geologically running through this corridor, and here's where it gets interesting. All of that rock in the Cascades is less than 40 million years. The Cascade rocks, the Cascade volcanoes, all the rocks related to the history of the Cascade Mountains, geologically, less than 40 million years old. And look at our guy here. More than twice the age of that. So something's wrong. Something's wrong about Mount Stewart. It's in the area. It's a beautiful peak. It's got snow on it. It's got mountain goats, the whole thing. But geologically, it's out of place. It doesn't match the pattern. Yeah, it's a little bit further to the east. But more importantly, it's way wrong with its age. So maybe I've really gotten your interest now. How do we explain that? How do we explain Mount, Saint, Mount uh, Stewart being so damn old? All right. Last concept that we did back in May that will be a review if you were here, and brand new if you haven't heard it before. Prepare to get your minds blown just a little bit. OK, this is a rock and roll place. All right, so just prepare to just get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some stuff at you now that if you haven't heard it before, you maybe aren't going to believe it. But after you sleep on it, you, you might feel better about it. Here we go. How can we explain that Mount Stewart has such old rock? The answer is, the state of Washington is built of a series of accreted terrains. Well, let's make it more interesting than that. The state of Washington is basically composed of a series of exotic terrains. That sounds more interesting. What do I mean? I mean that if we go back to North America 200 million years ago, that's twice as old as Mount Stewart, 200 million years ago, the west coast of Wash, excuse me, the west coast of North America was right here. 200 million years ago, this was the west coast of North America over by Spokane. There was no crust. There was no land making up the state of Washington 200 million years ago. This was the west coast. If you lived in Spokane 200 million years ago, you would have been at the beach. You would have been at the west coast, truly the west coast, waves breaking on the shoreline. And in the last 200 million years, Washington has been built piece by piece by piece. There's a piece, there's a piece, there's a piece, there's a piece. We're going to build Washington piece by piece, and each of these pieces of land is referred to as an exotic terrain. Exotic, meaning, here's the weird part, it's exotic to us as North Americans. It's foreign crust. It's material that was literally made someplace else in the Pacific Ocean Basin and has been brought to us and docked and added on to the edge of North America. Have you heard about this before? Some have, some have not. And you know, I could put the brakes on here. We could spend the whole rest of today just talking about these terrains coming in, because there's a lot to talk about. I promise talking about Mount Stewart specifically, so I'm not going to do that. That's a nice teaching move, isn't it? A lot of people go, I've never heard this before. I'm like, we're going on anyway. <laughs> OK, great. 
So let me give you an image to help you, at least cartoonishly, get an idea of how these pieces of land came to us. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for why we know the coastline was here and why these pieces came in. I'll give it to you quickly. There's old beach rocks in the, in the uh, Precambrian rocks of western Montana and even in the Spokane area. There's old structures that tell us for sure that was the tidal zone, that was the actual uh, coastline. And these pieces that we're calling exotic terrains are rock that do not match the age of the rest of North America. They don't even match each other. The analogy I sometimes use is a big quilt that your grandmother made for you once upon a time. And she used different patches of fabric for all the pieces of the quilt. We sew the quilt together, she did, but each of the patches of the quilt is completely different material. That's really the concept here. So each of those pieces of fabric came from different places west of us. So if, if you buy that, what's the idea, what's the going idea for how those pieces of land came to us and stuck? The answer involves plate tectonics, of course, moving pieces of, of crust. And I, I'm just warning you that I'm going back and forth so often that I'm sure I'm going to start using the marker on the chalkboard and the chalk on the whiteboard. If I do that, I'll, I, you know, it won't be as embarrassing because I, 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 I dreamt it. OK, great. Here's the idea. North America, that would be an N, A, moving west. Did you realize that North America slowly moves? It's a plate. We, we can document that now with technology. And, and this can be Spokane. So here's some people even though we don't think people lived 200 million years ago, but that's beside the point. All right, so our idea is for how did these terrains, I'm sorry, I have to do this. I keep tripping, and so I'm gonna, this is totally unprofessional. In fact, this is on television. <laughs> Some sort of strip tease, which is not appropriate on so many levels. I'm sorry for that. Stop right there. I, I will stop right there, uh, trust me, okay. <laughs> So cartoonishly, maybe we can even make some islands here. Cartoonishly, the idea is this. We have these pieces of land that got onto this moving ocean floor. And as the moving ocean floor came towards us and started to dive beneath us, these pieces of land got transferred from the ocean plate and we smushed it on to the edge of North America. All right? That guy is this guy. Let's continue the conveyor belt. Let's bring more of these terrains. That's what these are. These are the terrains. Let's bring another terrain in, and let's smush it on to the edge. Notice what, notice what happens to North America. We actually are gaining real estate, right? We're making North America larger. And what are we doing? We're building Washington. Piece by piece by piece, we are building Washington. Now, I know that you must have tons of questions about how did these things get on the plate, and what plate was it, and what's the timing of all this. That's for another day. We want to zero in on Mount Stewart, and we're going to get to this controversy in just a second. But I want you to have at least this general model that the state of Washington was built piece by piece, and pretty much by 50 million years ago, we have Washington built out to I-5. So in other words, from Spokane to I-5, we, we got all that stuff in place between 200 and 50 million years ago. That means that oh, the Olympic Peninsula is younger stuff yet. The Olympic Peninsula is material that has come in just in the last 50 million years. That's nothing. Last 50 million years and added that last part of the state of Washington. Why is Mount Stewart part of this discussion? Mount Stewart is part of a terrain. Mount Stewart is one of these guys coming in. The granite we talked about of Mount Stewart, that's how old? 93 million years. 
We think that 93 million year old granite was not created right here in North America, but offshore someplace and came in and docked, came in and added. We okay there? Okay. What the heck? Yeah, sure. All right. All right. Dramatic pause. Lights are very warm. Okay. Here it comes. All right. That was basically our first lecture in May. An hour down to 15 minutes. Now the rest of tonight is hot off the presses. Let's see how it goes. I feel that you're supportive, even if it's a train wreck. I feel that you'll, you'll, you'll embrace me uh, regardless. So thank you for that. Let's go ahead and try now. There's a controversy that has been going on for a good 40 years involving the Mount Stewart batholith. Batholith. The Mount Stewart batholith. A batholith is just a huge amount of granite. Okay, so the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, Yosemite National Park. You can, you've been to Yosemite, beautiful granite walls, half dome, etc. Yosemite is a very small part of a huge mountain range, the Sierra Nevada mountains, and the mountain range is entirely granite. That's a batholith. It's the Sierra Nevada batholith. There are other batholiths as well. So one more time, a batholith is a huge accumulation of granite. And we know how granite forms, right? It's magma that cools under a volcano. So it's a lot of this magma cooling underground. Okay, the Mount Stewart batholith. So the, the entire Mount, Mount Stewart range, not just Mount Stewart itself, but the entire range that we can see, and I'll show you some photos in a bit, is granite, which means that it formed under a volcano, and we're now realizing that volcano was not homegrown. That volcano that used to erupt above the granite of Mount Stewart was not right here in Kittitas County once upon a time. Here's the debate. How far has the Mount Stewart batholith traveled? That's the debate. Heated, angry words debate at these scientific meetings for 40 years. Unresolved, by the way. Still raging. I'll tell you about that, about that in a second. You got the question? The controversy, or the, 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 the question, the scientific uh, back and forth is how far did Mount Stewart travel? How, did, how far did the granite travel? Okay, let me outline the participants in the argument. There is a group of researchers primarily at Western Washington University in Bellingham, but other workers from around the country and around the world. This is, a, this is, a, 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 this is not just a regional story. There's people from distant places working on this problem, believe it or not. That group of folks says, and I believe this, I'm going, to, I'm going to give this to you straight, okay? This is a straight face. The magma that cooled to form Mount Stewart crystallized and docked in Mexico. And after it docked, that Mount Stewart granite got shifted north almost 2,000 miles to little old Kittitas County. That's the one group. It's a terrain. Nobody's arguing that. It's a terrain. It came in off the ocean. But it didn't come in here. It came in at 22 degrees north latitude at the south tip of present-day Baja California in Mexico. And that has been translated along faults more than almost 2,000 miles north. So that group and you see this in scientific papers. If you go and if you're an internet user, you type in Baja BC, and you'll get way more information than you want about this particular group. Baja BC. Why do they call themselves that? They're saying the Mount Stewart granite docked in Baja, California, Mexico, southern tip, and got moved all the way up to Washington slash British Columbia. Baja, B.C. 
The, uh, I'll give you the evidence that they have. We'll see what you, we'll see what you think. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to straddle these two groups here, okay? I'm not a player. I got, I got no, no dog in this race. There's other folks that say that's a bunch of hooey. Instead, they're pretty sure that the granite of Mount Stewart docked here at our latitude. Just kind of like I, I gave you the idea. Docks came in right off from the west, generally. And instead, has tilted locally. So we're going to call these guys, this is a less sexy name, uh, the tilt-in-place group. <laughs> That's not a very fun group to be in, it sounds like. I'd rather be in that group. That just sounds better. Okay? One more time. The debate is, did the granite that we know and love, just north of town, did it dock here at our latitude, or did it dock much, much further south and get shifted north? Okay. The next 15 minutes, I'm going to just work my butt off here to try to give you as much evidence as I can for this story here. And we'll see if it flies. And even if it doesn't, what the heck, okay? We've made progress already. And then I'll show you some pretty pictures, all right? And if this feels like it's just getting too much for you, just take a break and think of butterflies or something for a few minutes. And then I'll reel you back in after that, okay? All right, great. Let's do this. Uh, how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it this way. Both of these groups, both the Baja BC group and the Tilton Place group, are talking about a very strange concept called paleomagnetism. Paleomagnetism. Paleo, meaning the past. Magnetism, talking about the magnetic field of the Earth. And both groups agree that if you look at the granite in Mount Stewart, uh, they both agree there's granite in Mount Stewart, by the way. That's a good sign. They both agree it's 93 million years old. They both agree that it's foreign to us. It's exotic. And they both agree that if you look at the magnetite grains, magnetite is a mineral that is magnetic. It aligns itself with the magnetic field of the Earth. If you look at the magnetite grains in the granite of Mount Stewart, I'm going to portray it kind of cartoonishly like this. These are the magnetite grains that are very tiny that you can't even really see very well in a, in a usual granite. They both agree that there is a 35 degree angle to those magnetite grains. And what's the importance of that? These are grains that align themselves to the Earth's magnetic field when the liquid turned to solid. In other words, when the Mount Stewart granite formed, when it cooled, these magnetite grains aligned themselves parallel to the magnetic field at the time, 93 million years ago. With me so far? Everybody agrees on that. OK, the real debate is what this means. What's the significance of this paleomagnetism, this evidence for the magnetic field of the Earth 93 million years ago? OK, you're doing great. Let's keep it going. Uh, a little background on magnetism of the Earth real quick. Let's pretend we could all get up here easily and look at this flat stage and look at this flat piece of paper on the flat stage. And I'm going to grab a, a bar magnet. You know what a bar magnet looks like? It's long and thin. It's a magnet, OK? And I'm going to draw that for you here. So here's our bar magnet that we're laying on this flat surface on this piece of paper. And we've got opposite ends of the magnet. And let's imagine taking some iron filings in my pocket and tossing them, scattering them on this piece of paper. What's going to happen to the iron filings? They're going to align themselves to the magnetic field that's in this bar magnet, right? Do you have a concept of what the magnetic field looks like? It's invisible, but do you have a, have you remember that from a physics class or a science class? It kind of looks like this. I'm going to draw the magnetic field now, the invisible magnetic field of a bar magnet. It's going to be something like this. These are invisible lines of magnetic force 
that gather at the poles and do something like that. Okay. Now, if we put these iron filings around this bar magnet, what's going to happen? They're going to align themselves to these magnetic force lines. In other words, the little magnetic, the little iron particle, the iron filings around the middle part of the bar magnet are going to be parallel to the bar magnet itself. But here's the interesting part. If we get up towards the top and the bottom of the bar magnet, the iron filings are going to be perpendicular to the magnet. And even more importantly, if we look at the iron particles in mid-latitudes, there's going to be an angle between the intersection of the um, field of magnetism and the magnet itself. Now I'm going to try this in color over here because guess what? The Earth is just like a giant bar magnet. Our planet behaves just like this. We have a magnetic field, an invisible magnetic field that is exactly like this bar magnet. So instead of a bar magnet, I'm going to draw planet Earth with an equator and a north and a south pole. And I'm going to use, uh, I don't know, green for our invisible magnetic field. I'm going to do the same thing I tried to do over there. What are the green lines? Looks like an apple, doesn't it? The green lines are the invisible magnetic field. The magnetic field gathers at the poles. And these lines are intersecting the surface of the Earth at various angles. I have a professional diagram to show you that will really make it work well. The point is this, and this is the hardest part of tonight. When liquid magma starts to harden, the magnetite in the liquid aligns itself to the to the lines of magnetism during that time. And we can measure the angle of these magnetite grains in a particular rock, and here's the payoff. We can say something about the latitude at which that rock cooled. I'm going to say that again because that's the biggest part of tonight, actually. I'm going to say it again. We can study the angle of the magnetite grains in a granite to figure out the ancient latitude, or in other words, figure out how far north or south of the equator that liquid magma solidified. So let's talk about what Mount Stewart magnetite would look like. Actually, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll try this. This might be a tragic mistake, but we're going to try it, just to see if I'm getting through to anybody here. If we have magma form a rock with magnetite in it at the equator, what are the magnetite grains going to look like in this mountain if we're at the equator? They're going to be horizontal. The magnetite grains are going to be horizontal in a granite at the equator. Why? Because here's the equator right here, and here's our magnetic field, which is literally horizontal to the Earth's surface. It's parallel to the Earth's surface. Likewise, if we have another granite mountain with granite that formed at the North Pole, how are those going to look? They're going to be vertical. You got it. The magnetite grains are going to align themselves parallel to these green lines. And the green lines are doing different things at different latitudes. Now here's the, the idea for Mount Stewart. 35 degree angle. What is our latitude here? 47 degrees north is our latitude in Ellensburg. And Mount Stewart is 47 and a half degrees north latitude. These Magnetites in Mount Stewart today don't have a steep enough dip. They don't have a steep enough angle to work with our present latitude. These lines should be closer to this 
if the magnetite really formed in a cooling magma body at our particular latitude. That's where the idea comes from, from our Baja BC guys. They say, look, the only way to explain this 35 degree angle is to have the granite form much further south. Again, 22 degree north is the latitude that they have come up with, which is the south tip of Baja, California. Now, I don't know, I have to confess, I don't know why these numbers don't match up. There's a little bit of math involved, apparently, and some other things that I'm unaware of to reconstruct the details of these ancient latitudes. But this group out of Western Washington, to this day, believes with all of their heart that our beloved Mount Stewart formed in Baja, Mexico, and has somehow gotten up to us. Now, that's the real question, right? We're still talking about the people of Baja, B.C. What do they really visualize then? Uh, 90 million years ago, let's put in some uh, political boundaries here, even though they didn't exist 90 million years ago. Here's Canada. If your seat's starting to get uh, fidgety, we, we got another 10 minutes of this, okay? And then it's like, totally different thing. All right, good. All right, so Canada. Hey, hey I'm used to talk, talking to 19-year-olds, right? They're looking at the clock every five minutes. They're listening to every third word that I say. It, it, it's a real struggle. So, so uh, you may be just fine. You're probably just fine. Of course, you're just fine. You're just totally, you're, you're totally fine. You're, you're fine, right. So 90 million years ago, the Baja BC guys say, look, we're going to bring in a terrain with the granite of Mount Stewart, and it's going to be emplaced way down here. And where are we going to get Mount Stewart? We've got to get Mount Stewart to its present location. In other words, where are we going to get this granite? We're going to get this granite 1,800 miles from Cabo San Lucas to Leavenworth. <laughs> Mel's hole, yeah, right. So, um, so there's some sort of mechanism, I guess, right? If you're a Baja BC person, how does this work? How, how do you take something that docked this far south and get it north? Is it completely far-fetched? Not quite, actually. Not as far-fetched as you might think. Do you know about the San Andreas Fault? You know what it looks like in California? Let me make this a little bit more accurate. Oh, that's much better. Great. <laughs> All right. So here's Washington and, Ca and Oregon and California. And here's the San Andreas Fault. When there's big earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault, the, the west side of the fault suddenly lurches northward. This has been going on for a long time on the San Andreas Fault. So we're talking about structures like the San Andreas Fault. And the San Andreas Fault is existing in part because we have some big ocean plates that in our past have either moved north or they've moved kind of northeast a little bit. But the point is there's a northerly trajectory of much of our ocean plate history off of our shore to kind of um, encourage this northern shifting. At first glance, you might have thought this was a crazy idea. Maybe it's not sounding as crazy anymore. Or maybe it still is. More evidence that this is not so far-fetched. We, in Washington, have a San Andreas-like fault that is hard to find, but it's there, and it has done just what the San Andreas Fault has done. Our San Andreas Fault-like structure has been busily taking material to the west side of the fault and lifting it north. It's called the Straight Creek Fault. The Straight Creek Fault is just like the San Andreas Fault in that when it produces earthquakes, the west side of the fault goes up, or goes north, I should say. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick cartoon here, and then I, again, I have a couple images of what the Straight Creek Fault looks like in real life in Washington. 
Here's uh, Ellensburg. Here's Snoqualmie Pass. Here's Easton. You go straight north of Easton and look at the bedrock, the old bedrock. You can find a fault. And you can find great evidence. Oh, I've got to make this bigger because this is good. We know this now, right? I've got to make this bigger. Sorry. This is, this is good. If I say that enough times, it'll be actually good. All right. Uh, huh. Yeah. Allensburg, the pass, uh, Cleellum, Easton. And I'm saying that we have a San Andreas-like fault called the Straight Creek Fault that's just north of Easton and goes all the way up into Canada. What evidence do we have that earthquakes on the Straight Creek Fault have done the same kind of northward motion that the San Andreas has? Well, we can start with uh, the Easton Schist. There's a particular metamorphic rock just south of Easton, the little patch of it right here, and then you, then you try to follow this patch of Easton Schist uh, west, and suddenly it goes away, and you find it again up by Mount Vernon, or up close to Bellingham. This is about 60 miles of, whoops, or, I shouldn't put it like that, 60 miles of earthquakes shifting the crust on the west side of the Straight Creek Fault. I'll give you another one. Uh, rock near Holden Village, metamorphic rock near Holden Village. Where are we going to find it on the other side of the fault? Yes, we're going to find it up by the Trans-Canadian Highway. Again, I'm, the, I'm, out of the, I'm off the whiteboard now, but if, if the eastern schist was offset like this, we expect the same kind of offset of another structure as well. So we have a minimum uh, no, I'll just say it. We have 63 miles measured offset on the Straight Creek Fault. In other words, we've shifted the west side of this Straight Creek Fault 63 miles in the past. So I'm trying to bolster the, B, the Baja BC guys, right? They're saying we have structures like that, the San Andreas and the Straight Creek here in Washington that are doing just what we're talking about. That's all I've got to say about those guys. <laughs> Except that when I first moved to Ellensburg 20 years ago, and I learned from Don Ring and some others who have been working in the area, and I tried to get up to the speed, I was, ta I was told about this Baja BC thing, and it sounded kind of weird to me. And I, I didn't know much about paleomagnetism, so I just kind of avoided it, to be honest. I didn't teach much about it. And, and I was thinking over the weekend, this past weekend, what I was going to do with you guys. I said, I should, really, I should finally learn that stuff. So on Sunday, I typed in all this stuff, Baja BC, started learning stuff. The internet is an amazing thing, right? And I sent an email to a Baja BC person who did a lot of the work back in the 70s and 80s and 90s from Western. And I said, hey, this is Nick. I teach over at Central. You don't know me, but I've just found all your scientific papers. I know you're one of the leading Baja BC guys. Fill me in on the last 20 years. What's been going on? <laughs> and he says, oh, we, we got it nailed. We're, we're fine. We've done a lot of work since then. Got a lot new paleomagnetism evidence. Everything's sweet. Basically, he gave me the impression that the debate was over. And then I read a few more papers. And this is from the in-place tilt guys, who I'm getting to in just a second. And it's actually a friend of mine, Bob Butler. I did a TV show with him uh, uh, about a year ago. He's out of paleomagnetism research, and he's now doing uh, middle school teacher training. But he still was very involved, and he was one of the main opponents of the Baja BC guys. And he was like, uh, yeah, the debate's over. We win. <laughs> Baja BC is like totally run out of steam. So it's two quick emails to these two guys on opposite sides of the fence, and they both say the debate's over, and their side won. <laughs> so it's still going on. It's still going on. Let me give just a quick um, counter 
with the in-place tilt guys, and then we'll go to the photos, okay? So what does Bob Butler and some of these other guys who don't believe this 1,800 miles of movement? Maybe you're a skeptic. Okay, here's one question that they're asking. Uh, the San Andreas Fault is a big structure, and it's moved things thousands of miles. But the San Andreas Fault is younger than 20 million years. The San Andreas Fault, uh, remember, we're talking about the timing of this, right? We're saying we've got to get this thing up to Kittitas County back 100 to 50 million years ago. The San Andreas Fault is not a part of the discussion because it's too young. It was not there back when we're trying to get this Baja BC thing happening. That's number one. And part of what they're saying then is, I don't see a fault that can do this. I'm the, I'm the in place tilt guys now. I'll explain what that title means in a second. But the people opposing Baja BC say, I don't see the fault that allows this movement to take place. Show it to me. I don't see it in real life. I'm only going to believe something I can stand on. The Baja BC guys come back and say, well, there's been a lot of younger geology since that time that has basically covered it up. So you can see how these become kind of circular arguments. Let me give more evidence for the argument against Baja BC. Remember the Straight Creek Fault right here? Seem promising? There's a couple problems involving the Straight Creek Fault in the discussion as well. Number one, where's Mount Stewart on this cute little map here? It's here. It's on the wrong side of this fault. This is the fault that's doing this. So if we're doing all this northern mo motion on the Straight Creek Fault, we're on the wrong side of the fault to get Mount Stewart northward. Plus, and I'll show you this on a geologic map, there's a younger blob of magma that's 35 million years old that cuts across the Straight Creek Fault. I know most of you have not had geology formal training, but I'm wondering if anybody can tell me what this means about the history of the Straight Creek Fault. This, we've got a granite sitting right in the middle of the Straight Creek Fault. What does that mean about the history of the Straight Creek Fault? It's been dead for 35 million years. The Straight Creek Fault has not made any earthquakes, has not done any shifting in the last 35 million years. Do you see why? Our granite is not broken. Our granite is not like this. Right? The granite is nice and round, indicating that there's been no shifting since the granite showed up 35 million years ago. I know I'm getting a little heavy here, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. So what do the tilt-in-place guys say? Let's go back to our picture. It's not going to be too profound. I've kind of built this up and built this up. It's not that profound. Remember what we're, what we're trying to explain. We're trying to explain Mount Stewart with a 35 degree angle of its magnetized grains, its magnetite grains within the rock. Basically, the tilt in place guys say Mount Stewart, since it formed, has tilted in place. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> They're saying, you don't have to bring this granite from Mexico. This granite docked right here in Washington. It docked here in Washington, which means when it first cooled, when the magma first cooled here in Washington, it had a steeper angle like it should at a higher latitude like this, 47 and a half degrees north. And then the whole mountain has simply tipped, tilted, in place. And what's a logical way to explain that? Well, we have the cascades lifting right next door that can take our steep 
and rotate it to a gentler angle. And there's been furious work to try to find a documented fault or a series of structures that have the right age to show that kind of tilting going on. Do you get the crux of the argument? It's all about our landmark right here. That's why I chose to talk to you about it. I realize this is a little higher level than we normally do here. And it's, it's the first time. You may never come back. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, this, this, is, this has got some detail to it. And it's the first time I've taught it. In fact, I should probably check my notes to make sure I've covered everything I want to cover before I show you this. Yeah, did that, right. Uh-huh. Bernie Hausen is the guy at Western who emailed me. Nice guy. Yeah, straight quick. Yeah. Say again. It could have cooled before it docked. Could have cooled before it docked. When it was still out on the ocean. It could have. So it could have been a slightly different latitude. It could have, however, probably not dramatically different latitude if we're talking about these two end members here with this kind of tilt. And again, I don't know the details how you exactly get that latitudinal position, but I'll take your point that we don't have to have this forming right at the coastline. We could have it off the coastline, but I still think we're 25, 26, 21, something like that, probably still much further south. OK, thanks. So Chase, can you cut the lights? Thank you. And Barbara's uh, graciously helped to advance things here on the spot, so I appreciate that, Barbara. So I'll be uh, chirping to her every once in a while. OK, so you know what we're talking, right? Here's our, uh, here's our buddy. And in fact, this entire skyline is the batholith we're talking about. Not just Mount Stewart, but this entire range is this accumulation of granite called a batholith. And we're trying to decide if that docked in place or docked way down in Mexico. Uh, here we are tonight. Next one, Barbara. Well done. Uh, Want to point out just a simple landmark if you don't know it. You might know that basalt is the lava rock that makes up most of eastern Washington. And we in Ellensburg are right at the edge of that basalt blanket. And Table Mountain, Lion Rock, over here towards Lookout Mountain is the actual boundary. So in other words, uh, we are looking at the southernmost terrain area of what we're talking about tonight. This business of Baja BC involves not just Mount Stewart, but all of the terrains from Stewart all the way to the Canadian uh, border. And I'll give you some maps to give you a sense of that. So I'm focusing on Mount Stewart, but I'm really talking about many of the terrains of North Cascades National Park as being part of the Baja BC thing, potentially. Next one, Barbara. <clears throat> OK, here you go, sir. Here's a map that we have in our Geology 101 textbooks showing the terrains that we know currently in 2010. So let me help you with geography. Here's Mount Stewart presently. This is Washington. Here's British Columbia, Alaska, and Yukon Territory, or Northwest Territory. I forget which one. OK, so each of these colors is a separate terrain. And to be honest, each of these colors can be split into many more smaller terrains. So I'm going to change my answer. There's 50, 60 different terrains that have been mapped out, including the Blue Mountains, by the way, on the way to Boise. But these are the guys we're talking about that are part of this story. And notice that they're all, in, at least on this map, uh, strips that run north-south. Those are the Baja BC guys saying, yeah, we've got faults on the bound, bounding many of these terrain packages. And so we've been doing a lot of this sliding already. In fact, the Cache Creek is, is strung out this way. The Rangelia terrain, some of these rocks are the same up in central Alaska as well as Vancouver Island. Next one, please. Uh, here's just a quick backtrack to explain why we have these terrains to begin with. Uh, here's the old coastline as recently as 200 million years ago when we had this thing called Pangaea. So next one, Barbara. Spokane, then, is our beachfront city. And now, this is in a, uh, North America in a little movie, drifting away. And the point is, we're going to start collecting terrains as North America starts moving west. So we didn't have the terrains during Pangaea time, but as North America broke away from that supercontinent, we started picking up these uh, fragments of crust. 
Uh, why are we back to this, I wonder? Let's see. I guess just to point out that Mount Stewart is at the southern tip of this tremendous story. And by the way, I can't hold it. The terrains almost certainly extend south of us, but they're underneath all of our Columbia River basalts. So we don't really want to visualize that this is the southern edge of all of these terrains. The, the terrains extend all the way down to Mexico, literally. But we have these younger basalts stacked up on top. Next one. OK, very complicated map of Washington showing the geology. I suppose every Wednesday we're going to be looking at this in a different way. Tonight, what are we looking at? We're looking at Ellensburg. And we're looking at mainly these purplish rocks to the north of Ellensburg. These are the rocks that clearly don't match North America. Nobody's arguing that they're terrains or not. They're definitely terrains. They're definitely exotic pieces. But the question, of course, is did they come in straight from the west, or did they do this tremendous northward journey, El Norte, from Mexico? I just thought of that. Next one, please. Cute and obnoxious at the same time. Here's Ellensburg and the freeway heading to Snoqualmie Pass. Mount Stewart is in the kind of pinkish purplish area here. This is serpentinite, the greenish orangish rock that you may have seen on the hiking to Ingalls Lake uh, next to the true granite of Mount Stewart. I can't hold it either. Here's the Straight Creek Fault. So Easton, this, this line, this line, there's actually some arrows showing the northward motion. And there's that 35 million year old granite, by the way, sitting right up in the middle of the uh, range. Notice there's some other faults here as well that we might be able to talk about. Next one, please. OK, so pretty picture time. Ingalls Lake, Mount Stewart, and serpentinite, which is deep ocean trench rock that's now uh, thousands of feet above sea level. Next one. Oh, yeah, thanks for that. Next one. Here's a little movie showing everybody at the basic level how we are accumulating granite, how we are forming granite. It's liquid rock, it's hot, and then we solidify it by cooling it off. And as it cools, the magnetic grains are aligning themselves to the magnetic field, which we don't show there. The serpentinite is actually forming here in the trench. So the green serpentinite is forming here, the granite is forming there. Next one. And here they are, juxtaposed, right next to each other. The serpentinite, which is much older than the granite, but most people now believe that these two guys came in together. In other words, this was a package deal. And I think I even gave the wrong impression in May when I gave that talk. A few minutes to go. Next one, please. Back to the diagram, I guess, to emphasize the serpentinite now, but I already jumped the gun, so let's move on, Barbara. Uh, yeah, children and Mount Stewart, and walking on serpentinite. So serpentinite is green, but it weathers, or it oxidizes, or it corrodes to this deep orange rock. So the next time you're up there, you'll, you'll see it pretty easily. Next one, please. Mountain goat and 93-million-year-old granite. Is it really Mexican? <laughs> next one, please. Not the goat, the rock. Is, 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 is the rock granite? Next one, please. OK, just more shots of, again, these two rocks that are from distant places. Next one. Clearly threw in too many photos of this, but uh, here's some beautiful glacial striations. So there's a glacial history as well to explain the jaggedness of Mount Stewart. But we're really ignoring that part of the story. And of course, that's a very recent part of the story as well. Next one. OK, really threw in too many. Here's serpentinite again. Look at that orange. Real easy to find it because it rusts so orange-like. Next one. OK, next one, Barbara. Uh, next one, Barbara. Good Lord. OK, I, I really threw in too many of these. One more. This is a nice summary slide before we move on to our final few diagrams that have a little bit of meat to them. Here's our three players in the story. We'll have a separate lecture talking in more detail about these basalts coming down the road. This is up on Table Mountain with a bunch of middle school kids from a long time ago. Next one. They're all grown-ups now. Finally. Thank you. OK. So this is what I was trying to draw. I don't know if it came across to you before, but here it is out of a 101 textbook that I use. Here's our bar magnet. 
Here's our flat piece of wood. West of this line is made out of terrains. Everybody left or west of that black line is junk that's come in off the ocean. That's most of California, Oregon, Washington, most of BC, Baja California itself. Next one. This is going to be magical. All right. 70 million years ago, so we go 30 million years in the future. Now we bring this terrain much further north. We're still not there though, right? Now Mount Stewart is in central Nevada. We got to get it to where it belongs. Next one. We get it up there approximately 50 million years ago. We finally get these terrains where they're supposed to be. And in the most recent 50 million years, we build the Olympic Peninsula. I think there's a couple more and then we'll quit. Uh, next one, please. So here's Mount Stewart, presently located. Here's Highway 2 coming from Everett, heading over towards Wenatchee. We don't see Wenatchee because it's in the basalts. Here's a cartoon showing the Straight Creek Fault. Again, it doesn't help us move to Mount Stewart north because it's on the wrong side of the fault, but the Baja BC guys really love these other faults, which are also strike-slip faults, which have northward motion on the west side. So they're thinking maybe the, the Eniat and the Ross Lake and these other faults have been part of the translation that we've been talking about, but certainly not responsible for almost 2,000 miles of motion. Next one, Barbara, please. One more time. Here is the Straight Creek. Can we see those other faults? There they are. Fault there, fault there, fault there. Are they significant faults with our translation story, our Baja BC story? I guess the debate continues. I was, I was privately hoping to send those emails and have them go, yep, so I'll figure it out. Here's the answer, and good luck with your lecture on Wednesday night. But I certainly did not get that message. Last one, Barbara. Back at it again, just showing that relationship. So, to summarize quickly, what did we do tonight? We talked about the Mount Stewart granite and how it formed and how Mount Stewart was not a volcano. We then got into the idea that there was a way to try to figure out the ancient latitude of where that granite formed. And that was part of our whole discussion of what a terrain was. And we're now left with this kind of bad feeling that we haven't solved the problem. But you know what? That's what science is. Science should be taught like this, in my opinion. It hasn't all been figured out. And science is exciting because we're constantly working on these mysteries and trying to get closer and closer to the truth. And that's my pitch to get more geology majors into our program. You can help solve this. Take your calculus, take your physics, take your field camp, and then go out and try to work on this. And these 20-year-olds are pumped up and ready to go. Then they have families and other things and mortgages and it all goes to hell. But for a moment there, <laughs> it's really good. So I thank you all for coming out tonight and I certainly hope to see you next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>